Well, hello everyone, and welcome back. Yeah, today I'm going to talk about the video that we all watched the other day. If you missed it, I'm going to leave a link over to Michael's channel. He got together with uh, Chad, Bernie, Ryan K. Smith, and they had a great discussion about uh, digital, analog, records, Future of records, how records are made, what's good, what's bad. Man, it was really interesting. Kind of stuff I really like to talk about, really like to learn about. And so I guess uh, first thing we'll talk about here, Bernie was saying that uh, <clears throat> the only true storage medium for music that will last and give us <clears throat> the true music on it is analog tape. It was a shocker to me. He says the digital medium, it loses information over time. It's not a stable thing. It, it degradates over time. I thought that was the big problem with, with tape. Apparently it's even worse with digital. And this brings me to the next part of the thing, right? Uh, Sony, kind of, you know, what is this, what is DSD, right? DSD is SACD. Now, Sony invented the SACD. They invented that medium <clears throat> because, you know, Sony, they, uh, they bought Columbia, they bought RCA, they bought Epic, they got Arista, and of course it was Sony CBS, so they've got a huge amount of, of library of music. And Sony's headquarters over there is in New York. So when Sterling Sound was in New York, they could get the tapes. But now Sterling has moved to Nashville. That's where Ryan K. Smith's now working. So there's nobody left over there. And anyway, Sony has said they're not going to give anybody the tapes anymore. Them, those days are over with. We're only going to give you a DSD file. We're not going to do any more tapes. Those are locked in the vault and they're going to stay in the vault. Okay, getting back to why did Sony invent this in the first place? Because they've got a huge vault and they've got a lot of old tapes that are falling apart. So they said, we need to come up because, you know, they're the curators of all this history. We've got to be able to, you know, we've got to have this for posterity. We've got to be able to keep this, all this music that we've got. So we've got to invent this, something that will have staying power because obviously this tape over years, you know, we want to keep it for hundreds of years. How are we going to do that? This tape won't be, doesn't, isn't able to do that. So they invented DSD, and one times DSD is SACD. And once they invented that medium, then they came out with the compact, you know, the SACD format. But originally, the why they invented that, because as y'all remember, you know, back in the 90s, it was, hey, it's perfect sound forever. And that's another thing Bernie had mentioned on the video. He said, you know, when Sony was putting out all this, everything that came on a digital tape for him to do. He said, listen, I can't make copies of this digital. It degrades. And they thought he was crazy because they said, hey, it's ones and zeros. And he said every time he'd go to a show, the, the Sony people would run away from him because they didn't want to talk to him about it. They were embarrassed to talk about the fact why one of the best you know, mastering engineers in the world says that their format isn't, it doesn't work well for him. So they didn't want to talk to him. So it turns out that this DSD isn't the holy grail for archiving our, our music. Tape is. You know, another really good medium for archiving music is vinyl records, right? I've got records that are 50 years old. They sound just as good as the day I, I bought them. And I think that the van vinyl will be, will have the staying power in the future because that's not going to degradate, right? The tapes do, they lose oxide, 
the DSD files, they lose the, the bits, the zeros and ones all of a sudden. They, they float off for some reason. And this, this whole idea of digital being the best format sound-wise too, as we know, we don't like it. And of course, let's talk a little bit about the MoFi thing. Because it's all about, like I've been saying for the last 10 years, it's all about what are you comparing it to, right? A lot of these one steps, a lot of the MoFi stuff was really good. It's like anything you dig it. It's like this, for instance. These have come out now. This is the, um, the Half Speed Mastered from Abbey Road. I've got, I've got these two titles. Now, I've got a... Uh, Island Pink Rim of this, a UK pressing. I used to have for, I think since I bought the record new, it was on the original UK press, and I thought it always sounded phenomenal. I had no need to ever buy another copy of anything because I was so happy with that UK press until I happened to come across a first edition Japanese press of this, and I said, well, here, the Japanese is no way going to beat that, and it did. I heard more music on the Japanese pressing than I heard on the original UK pressing, as I've done in other shootouts with the David Bowie stuff that was a UK press versus the, the digital record versus the original J Japan pressings. But, you know, these original Japan pressings from this year are very, very rare. They're very hard to get a hold of. But we're going to leave that for another day. But it's, this is kind of the wave of the future, folks, is all these digital records, right? Just like MoFi is doing. They're doing digital records. So what's better? Is the analog record better or the, or the digital record? Because those MoFi's, they sound good. Most of them do, yeah. So can we compare some? Well, Chad talked about it, and we all know what you can compare, right? You've got Kind of Blue. That Bernie Grumman did it from the original three-track for classic records. And Chad used uh, those uh, those plates to make his his UHQR right. To make this record right here, right. And Mofi's got a reissue of that, but theirs is from a digital file. Also, uh, we've got Muddy Waters folk singer, right? Bernie Grumman uh, also remastered this for classic records from the original 1964 Chess Master Tape. Then you've got Stevie Ray Vaughan, Couldn't Stand the Weather, that Ryan K. Smith did for acoustic sounds. And every time, I've watched a lot of videos on this stuff because I don't have those records. I don't have any... I think this sounds fantastic. And my experience is... When I go get a one-step, or I go, and Chad's redone this now with the same plates, is it going to be better? Yeah, just, you know, a teeny little bit better. It's not really, it's not worth it for me to go start spending $100 to go get whatever difference is. I'm happy with this, because to me, it's it's right up there with whatever the best is. This is right, right next to it, right? So I don't have those to compare to. But... People that have bought the MoFi's now and they've compared those records, they all say that the these are far superior, right? This one is far superior to the One Step. The Steve Ray Vaughan is far superior, the Analog Productions one. All the ones from the Analog Tape sound better. There's more music on the record. There's more information. And this is what Bernie was talking about on the video. How... Every time you do, you get a digital source, right? You get that DSD tape. It's already a copy of something, right? It's no longer the original. It's already gone down. One little bit of degradation has happened because you've made a copy of it. Now, a DSD copy of a master tape is going to sound phenomenal. It is. It's going to sound fantastic because it's, it's a copy of the master. Those things always sound good. They do. And I think... Chad or Bernie had said too that there is so many records out there that we have a copy of. 
It's not the original master. It's a first generation copy of the master. And a lot of many, many great sounding records have been made with those kinds of tapes. You know, like the Japanese pressings. They didn't get the original, but they have the first generation master from the original. Because the, those UK ma originals stay in the country of origin. That's why we all like the OG and the country of origin as a rule of thumb, right? So... Let's talk a little bit about talk about wire a little bit too. We'll do that. We'll do that next because Bernie said wires make a difference, especially in digital, because you got the right channel, the left channel, <clears throat> and you got the the clock information, and it's with that stuff, and it really messes up the signal. So he really had to spend a lot of time listening to the wires to get it to. To do it, and he spent they they spent a lot of time listening to wires to get it to sound right. So that brings me up to something about Kevin Gray, right? When they went to Coherent Audio, these records here now. This is a Music Matters record, the early ones that were on the on the forty five RPM. They were mastered at Acoustech. Kevin Gray mastered these with Steve Hoffman over at Acoustech. That was at RTI. And then at a certain point, RTI got really busy. So Chad built his quality record pressing plant. Warner Brother went over to Germany. MoFi stayed at RTI. Kevin Gray left RTI and he started Coherent Audio. And it was right in the middle when they were doing all these Blue Note stuff. So one of the gentlemen that was part of that process for the Blue Note stuff was a guy named Joe Harley. And he is involved with AudioQuest cables. So he went over to Coherent Audio and he was listening to the gear. And he told Kevin, he said, listen, I think if we change your cabling in here, it's going to make a big difference on these records. They're going to sound a lot better. So Kevin agreed and they changed all over to AudioQuest. They never, didn't say in the article what kind of AudioQuest cable, but they changed them all over. And Kevin said, yes, I really can hear a difference. And it's an improvement where it's not changing anything. It's only improving things. I'm not, I'm not hearing it where it changes it for the bad. Something's going wrong in any, in any of this. It all sounds fantastic, and I'm hearing more music. So that's why Kevin was able to now, he's able to make a 33 and a third record that sounds just as good as the 45s that he did over at Acoustech. The stuff he can make it coherent now at 33 is just as good as the 45 stuff he was making over at Acoustech. There's a little bit of subtle differences in the sounds when you listen to them. I've got a video that I put out comparing one of the 45s to the, the classic issue now that came up because he's making that a coherent. And <clears throat> Chad had made it earlier when he got, was at Acoustech. So I've got a video. I can leave a link to that one too if you want to look at that video. So wires make a difference. Bernie talked about that. And it's evidenced by what happened over at Kevin Gray in Coherent Audio. Now, another thing that's important is, you know, what about that tape? Where does that tape come from? Because the mastering engineer has got to use the original master tape, right? If that master tape doesn't sound good, how's he supposed to make a good record? So this is important. The recording engineers and the mixing engineers, people who make that tape, they have to have special abilities as well. So that's another very important step in the process. And once you've got that lacquer made now, now once Bernie or Kevin or Ryan K. Smith, and those places now we're talking about coherent audio, we're talking about Bernie Garman mastering, we're talking about Sterling Sound. Those are like the three 
places I know in the United States that can make a analog lacquer. There isn't, I don't think, any other place that can do it. There's a lot of places that make records, but they're not making analog records. They're making digital records. And RTI doesn't do any plating that I know of, or, yeah, they still do plating over there, but what's important about the electroplating process, it's a step in the process that a lot of people don't realize how important it is. This is another step in the process that if you have, it's an art form, and Bernie touched on, talked about it, and Chad talked about it, and there's a guy involved in this whole process called Gary Salstrom. He worked over at RTI, okay, and when uh, Michael Hobson, Michael Hobson is the guy from Classic Records, he's the founder of Classic Records, and when Chad bought all of uh, the Classic Records inventory, you know, Michael Hobson told him, he said, you need to go over to RTI and you need to go get Gary Salstrom. You need to go over there. He's going to be so important to your company. He's going to help you build QRP to be a powerhouse because he is about the smartest guy out there that knows how to make records and especially the plating process. So Chad was able to get him from RTI, bring him over, and he's been basically running the whole operation there for a number of years now. But, as Chad talked about, Gary's no longer at QRP. And Chad was uh, like, he was ready to have a, a meltdown because, you know, Gary, you can't leave. How, who's going to do my stuff? And they, they, yeah, they all said, listen, I haven't been plating records for a while now. I've trained these folks to do it. All these records have been coming out lately. I haven't been doing it. They've been plating it. I've trained them to do it. Don't worry. But now, um, Gary has moved over. He's now over at Vinyl Me Please, over there in uh, Denver, Colorado. That's where Denver's making an audiophile facility to make audiophile records. That's what Vinyl Me Pleases wants to do now. They have been doing and they're going to get Gary over there. So we know that that's going to be another place where they're going to be able to make analog records. And we got a really good guy over there doing that, making their records for him. So the plating process is another key factor. And that's another reason why the Japanese records sound so good is because they always were very meticulous in the plating process and they use Japanese super vinyl. And that's one of the things that MoFi has that, that, that Chad doesn't have. I think the, the super vinyl that RTI has developed is better than the vinyl that Chad uses. It's quieter. Anybody that's heard one of these one steps, you instantly realize how quiet that vinyl is and how it lets you hear deeper into the, into the music. This is one of the things that, that cables do, that power cords do, that good amplifiers do, that good phono sections do, the noise floor is always gets lower and lower and lower, and you can hear more of the, the finer inner details in the music because the noise floor is lowered. And with vinyl, you know you have a certain noise floor. The hotter you cut it, the more hard it is for the, for the cartridge to track, and the lighter that you cut it, the more of the surface noise you hear on the record. So that's another thing the mastering engineers have to do, be very good at is what volume I'm going to set it at. And that volume also tells you how long that record's going to be before it gets to the runoff groove, right? So what's some of the other stuff that they were talking about? The digital. You know, Bernie was saying that the digital sounds clean. Right? It's got a clean sound to it. It really does. It's because things are missing. That's why it sounds cleaner. He says you lose ambience. You lose the natural sound of the top end. You lose the integrity. The integrity of the music. You lose some of that integrity in the music. And it sounds processed. And you always lose information when you do a conversion. And obviously, if it's recorded digital, it has to be converted into analog. 
So you've always got at least one step in there where you're doing conversion. Let's give it the benefit of the doubt. When you record it digitally, you've got it. Okay, now you do a conversion. Now you're losing some of the sound. Now if you want to manipulate it, you want to do EQ on that stuff, you've got to convert that DSD. has got to be converted into PCM. If you want to do, you can't do any kind of uh, EQing in the DSD domain. And every time you go back from PCM to DSD to analog to digital, all those steps are degradating the sound. The less you do that, the better it's going to sound. So when, we, when Bernie was talking about all that stuff, I was thinking, well, maybe that must be kind of what MoFi does. But I did a little bit of research into that whole MoFi deal, right? So what do they do? They get the original tape, and then they make a copy of it. They make a DSD file. So right away, you've already got a step in the process, right? You're making a copy of it. So you don't have the original tape anymore. You're making a copy of it. Now, Bernie said that you could, he, a lot of times, if that tape's good, he can run it flat right into the cutting head and make the lacquer right from the tape without any manipulation at all. So if you're going to do digital, that's really, if you're going to try to do audio file digital, you've got to cut it right from the DSD right into the cutting head. Because, like you said, when you start trying to copy it, you can't copy digital. It doesn't work well. Every time you manipulate it, it changes the sound. It degradates the sound. You start losing stuff, like ambience. And it kind of, you know, rang true for me because back in about 87 or so, when I had was trying to decide, am I going to go with this new digital stuff or if I'm going to stay with my records, right? And I had some the CDs and the records that were the same title. And I compared them. And every one I compared, the record sounded better. Had more music on it. And then as time went on and I was able to compare some digital and analog, I found that it was like the ambience. It was the spatial cues. It was the placement of the instruments. It was the sound stage. Of course, the cymbals. And those drum skins. Those were all the things that I noticed that were affected by the digital. And sometimes they did a good job of it. Like I, you know, Run Up Groove makes great, really good records. They sound good, but how do we, how will we ever know how good it could sound if it was ever done analog? Because it's always a digital tape to start with. So when you're talking about, you know, Brothers in Arms, and you're talking about, you know, the Nightfly, things like that, they're started out digital, right? So I was always wondering, why are they making audiophile records of, of digital in the first place? So now we know they're making digital records. So they've got the tape, then they make a DSD copy. Now you've got it. You can't make a lacquer of, of digital. The, the tape machine that they use does, isn't digital, right? So they've got to do an analog transfer. They've got to make an analog tape. And then they can run it into their Gain 2 system. So what's this Gain 2 system? Right? The Gain 2 system. I did a little research on the Gain 2 thing. Because when I... I've got some records that I bought in the 90s. And it says that the Gain 2 system predominantly is where they replace the op amps with a... Uh, class A amplifier. And everybody knows that Class A amplifiers are probably the best sounding amps out there. They have their drawbacks, but when you when you try to run them, you get, get volume out of them. You know, when you're using it on a cutting head, you're talking about lower volume, so it doesn't have the heating issues and all that stuff that Class A amps have. But Class A is the best, though. What they did was... Uh, the guy who they had developed this was Tim Pavavicini and Stan Ricker both. So it was Stan Ricker and Tim D. Pavavicini. They did the uh, they did the Game Two system as well as Ed Meitner. Really makes really good amplifiers. A Canadian guy 
and of course past labs. He didn't say if Nelson Pass was involved in it, but they just say past labs is involved in the process as well. So they got the Game 2 system. They've got a Studer tape machine and they have hand-crafted cutting amps by Tim DiPaverici-Vaccini. He's the guy that handcrafted the cutting amps. Those are now, instead of op amps in that machine, they're, they're Class A amps. And they drive the Newman cutting head and the lathe. So the amps that are driving the cutting head are Class A amplifiers. That's really good. That'll get you, that'll get you some audiophile quality sound. So that's a good thing. That's what that does. And that Gain 2 system is all analog because this Studer is a analog machine, right? So they've got the original tape, then they got the DSD copy, then they got to transfer that to analog, and then they run it through the Gain 2 system. And that's the minimum a number of steps that I, uh, that I can understand how they're going to make a copy of this record, right? So if they want to manipulate it at all, if they want to do any EQ, they're going to have to change it to PCM, right? And then they can do their uh, equalization. But Bernie was saying too about when you try to do equalization in the digital domain, it's not the same as analog. If you've got an equalizer on, and it's an analog tape and you just want to move, say, at 2,000 kilohertz, it only affects that 2,000 kilohertz. But when you've got a digital recording and you are start to move a little bit on the 2,000 kilohertz, it changes, it changes everything. Everything gets changed because of the way that the digital is recorded and the error correction. All the way all that stuff works together, you can't just manipulate little pieces of it. When you try to manipulate a small part, of you're manipulating everything. And this is what causes the degradation in the holes, all of the sound. Okay. So that's going back to that super vinyl. Um, I noticed when I had, I have got that one step of close, I'm not close to this, but yes, uh, yes, fragile. And I had the Kevin Gray. Uh, cut or to compare it to and I one of the reasons I like the one step better than that was because of the vinyl was so quiet and I could hear a little bit more deeper into the music and I could hear a little bit more detail that way they were close I haven't re-watched the video I don't remember how close they were whatever the comparison was but I do remember thinking about that at the time how this vinyl is so quiet, it's letting me hear more of the details of the music. I said that, to me, that was one of the biggest differences between the two records, was that vinyl formulation. So I think that's really important. If we can get more of that RTI super vinyl out there, but, but you know, Micah the Ingroove has talked about this too, about the high rejection rate of that vinyl. It's more costly to make records using that vinyl because of the rejection rate is higher. And the same thing with, uh, you know, the vinyl that Chad uses. They have to make the records by hand because it doesn't work in automated presses. So these better, higher vinyl formulations cost more to even produce. And they cost a lot more to make records that way because of all of the, the it just, you have to make three records to get one, basically. So... It, they're going to cost more because of the, all the, the labor involved, the time involved, the process that's involved in making the records. But this really does make a big difference in the record. So I'm willing to pay a little bit more for that vinyl if that's something that people need to... I like that idea. I think that's a good thing that people... They, the record companies need to investigate that a little bit more. And talking to about about Sony having all those tapes over there in New York and how they're not going to let any of the analog stuff out anymore. What does this hold for the future of making records? I watched the guy's video and he was talking about all the records that Chad's made lately that are from the original master tapes. And you know what? Every single title was 
from the United States. Or he had already had the tape, had the plates, like he did the dress roll tall, but he already had the plates. He didn't wasn't he didn't go get the tape again. All the tapes that he's been getting are here already in the United States. How do you how are you supposed to get tapes from the UK? You know, this is what we end up. This is what we end up now with UK bands. If you like UK bands, this is what kind of stuff we're ending up with from the UK. It's all digital stuff. So, I don't know what the future is going to be for this DSD, but, but you know, we know it's not as good as right from the analog tape. We've got things to compare to, right? We've got stuff like this. We know what sounds better because it's about what you're com comparing it to. So I hope you liked my little my little talk. I'm going to do a little comparing here. I think after I stop the video here and I put it on YouTube, I'm going to crack those open and start listening to them. And thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and bye for now.